Okay, well, I think we'll get started. There may still be a few people coming in, but uh, it's uh, five after seven now. So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is James Jensen. I'm the executive director of the Osgoode Township Museum. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all tonight to uh, this evening's talk, not digging it. Before we get started, um, I'd just like to take a moment to uh, observe that the Osgood Township Museum acknowledges that our museum, located in Vernon, Ontario, just south of Ottawa, is on the traditional unceded ancestral land of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. The Algonquin Anishinaabe are the original inhabitants of this territory along the Ottawa, Rideau, and Castor Rivers and have lived on this land since time immemorial. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to present, to be present in this territory. So just a little bit about the museum itself before we get started. Um, we are located in the community of Vernon, Ontario. It's in the southernmost portion of uh, Ottawa. It's been operating since 1973. This year is our 50th birthday. Um, the museum tells the story of Ottawa's agricultural and rural heritage uh, in the former Osgoode Township. If you visit the museum's grounds during the spring, summer, or fall, you get a chance to wander around the grounds, visit the 10,000 square foot heritage garden that is modeled after a 1907 school garden. And here's some views of our collection. Um, the main museum building houses a an eclectic collection of approximately 10,000 artifacts. Um, the artifacts in the collection range from 3D objects like household items, such as potato mashers, to full-size tractors and threshing mills. So thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. Um, the talk is gonna be about an hour long. Um, and it'll include a short time set aside at the end for you to ask questions. Um, if you'd like, you can type your questions into the chat throughout the presentation, and we will read them to our speaker uh, to answer at the end. Um, and uh, just so you know, the talk is being recorded, and it will be uploaded to the museum's uh, YouTube channel um, for access later as well. So um, I'd like to welcome our speaker, Jamie. Jamie and her partner Robbie have operated the Rutabaga Ranch since uh, 2019 in Princeton. And tonight she's going to talk about how she found herself farming and the regenerative and no-till techniques used on the ranch. And I think I am going to hand things over to Jamie. How's go. it going guys? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna get into this here. All right, so my name is Jamie and I'm the head rutabaga of Rutabaga Ranch. Um, we bought our farm in 2019, but we actually didn't get rolling until 2021 was our first season. I think so. Um, tonight, we're going to talk to you a little bit about starting the farm, an introduction to how we got here, why rutabaga, and why regenerative agriculture is sexy, and how supporting your local farmer is cool, as well as what you can do to support your local farms. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we farm on traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Ashinaabe people. We are grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory. Um, a big one to note is I am not a teacher. I am a farmer and some could say I was raised in the barn and I have a really bad habit. Some of you guys already know this if you follow me on Instagram and I know my aunt Ethel is in this chat room of swearing when I'm nervous. Uh, this is my first talk I'll be doing um, about our farm. So I am a little nervous. So if I curse, please go lightly on me. All right, so who are we? Um, the farm is owned by me and my husband, Robbie. I am the full-time farmer of this farm. Um, it's my dream come true. And 
I manage the day-to-day. Robbie actually works off farm full-time, um, but he's very much a part of the farm. He's the head repairman, ultimate farm fixer extraordinaire, and he actually works in forestry. And we heat our farm exclusively with waste wood from his jobs. So we turn waste wood from uh, the city kitties who don't want it and turn it into organic vegetables, which is kind of cool. So I thought we could watch this little video um, to tell you a bit more about us. My name is Jamie and I am the head rutabaga at Rutabaga Ranch. We are an acre and a half market garden and we grow about 45 different crops. I grew up on a conventional dairy farm um, and I always loved the farm, but it was important for my mom that I had a education. So I pursued a career in social work and ultimately burnt out from that. And I was looking for a way to get back on a farm and figure out a way to become a farmer for myself without needing a big capital investment. So yeah, I worked on a market garden for a season and it all just kind of fell into place. My biggest fear of getting into market gardening was definitely finances to see if this was financially viable for us to make a living at. Um, I think eco farms are important but one thing that's really important for eco farms to continue and for us to continue farming in an eco-conscious manner is that the farm is financially viable. One way that we came at this year and how we wanted to differentiate ourselves between other farms especially at markets um, was we followed the season extension protocols and methodology of the master class. So yeah that kind of puts a little bit of a face to the name for mm -hmm. what we're kind of doing. Um, yeah, so Robbie and I are both hometownies. We are both born right here in the Winchester Hospital. Uh, this is actually what Robbie looks like without a beard, for those of you who know him now. Um, I was born and raised on my parents' dairy farm in Toys Hill, which is just like a little bit south of South Mountain. And Robbie spent his summers helping out at his Uncle Francie's dairy farm in Princeton. And this is a picture of Robbie... Uh, with his show cow whenever he was in 4-H. And that's me as a little baby in the hay manger. Both of us come from multi-generational farming families, which means that our families farmed back till back when everybody's families farmed. Um, this is a photo of my grandfather, Jacques Thurler. This is him in Switzerland. And this is what the milk truck looked like way back when. It seems to be a boxer dog pulling some sort of like home jobby cart with two milk cans on it. So he was probably bringing his milk from that day to the local cheese maker. And then this is a picture of Robbie's great grandparents, Olive and Lorne. And the story has it, Olive was quite a farmer and she actually lost two of her fingers in a hay haying accident, which makes, you know, pretty hardcore. So although neither of us were in line to take over our family's dairy farms, we both knew we wanted a life on the land, similar to how our great grandparents lived. So to make a long story short, we bought the beat up Left 4 Dead Lennox farm in 2019, which lucky for us, nobody really wanted. Um, it was a farm that needed and still needs a lot of love a farm that was so filled with treasures and garbage from its past farmers, uh, it actually made it extremely affordable to the lucky duckies who wanted to put the work in. I like to say, don't trust anyone who says you can't polish a turd because a little bit of blue paint can go a long way. Uh, we took our old farmhouse from spooky to beachy with one can of paint. Um, with nine beautiful acres of pasture land untouched by conventional or modern agriculture, we begrudgedly followed the wisdom of my old man farmer dad who said, which I will just slow, quickly point out, that this is actually the first picture Robbie and I ever took together on our farm. And back behind our heads, you can kind of see the remnants of an old wooden silo. That's actually where our plant nursery is now, just to give you a little bit of context. So yeah, we ended up listening to my dad who said, you never buy a farm for the house, always the land. You can always build, fix, tear down, clean up buildings, but it's very hard to change the soil on your farm. Someday the soil will pay to make the rest of the farm nice, which he was right. We have um, about two feet 
a beautiful topsoil. The first time my dirt doctor came over, he couldn't believe the organic matter and life that was going on in there. Um, so yeah, this is a picture of my dad with cow. And wow, was he right? Is there any better way to bond with your partner than hauling not only one, but 17 broken chest freezers out of your newly purchased barn? No. <laughs> Uh, you can see that our farm needed a lot of work and a lot of cleanup when we found it. Um, so these two photos were actually taken only four months apart to give you some context of how much ass we hauled, so to speak. Um, but we knew that our farm was going to be perfect for us because not only was the soil beautiful, the price right. Uh, it also happened to be smack dab between Robbie's family farm and my family farm, which was really nice. So literally next road north is my family farm and the next road south is his. And as we started cleaning up the farm, we actually learned a lot more about the farm's history. Uh, we learned that our farm was built in 1870. Our barn was actually moved in pieces to the farm and then resurrected, which the notches in the beams don't quite line up. So that tells us that it was somewhere else at some point. And we heard through the grapevine that our house was actually rolled into place on logs. And our farm was one of the first farms with electricity and steel gates, which I'm sure you can imagine when everything was always built with wood to get some steel gates to keep some pigs in line was a big change for agriculture at that time. Our farm used to be a mixed species farm. It had everything from pigs to honeybees, but was predominantly a dairy farm back in its day. And our old boy neighbor, Ursel Wickwire, told us that it was one of the nicest farms in the whole county back in the day. And you can see here a picture of probably someone in the Lennox family in a horse and wagon in front of our house before it was painted blue. Uh, we even were lucky enough to have Mary Lennox, and Mary, if you're listening, thank you so much, um, who is a family member, send us beautiful photos of our, the farm. So you can see, like, our barn was red, some of the buildings that we had to tear down are standing, looking beautiful. And for as spooky as our old farm was, we never really felt creeped out about being here. We always kind of got a sense that we were helping finish the farmers before us story, instead of creating our own. And this is one of my favorite photos that Mary sent us. I'm not quite sure who this guy is, but just judging by like, I know exactly where he's standing in our backfield because of the trees and seeing the barn in the background. And I know we know that people walk the earth before us, how it's, we all just know that it's common sense, but to actually see this like strapping young man farmer standing in my field, I can pinpoint his exact location and go stand there. It just, it blows my mind. When with the farm cleanup being well underway, it very quickly took a back seat as we began to wrangle this ranch into a vegetable farm. This picture here is actually Robbie and I putting the very first ground post in for our big greenhouse. Uh, we ordered the kit. It was supposed to come in September, but actually didn't end up showing up until January. So we built a greenhouse in minus 40, which was quite the experience. Um, we ordered supplies we couldn't afford. We maxed out every available line of credit and credit card. Because pro tip, if you are listening and thinking about starting a farm, the bank doesn't like it when you tell them you're going to quit your real job to start an organic vegetable farm. So our greenhouse kit started showing up and then something very unexpected and magical happened. Magical happened. Our community showed up for us. Uh, coming from a farming family and far, like starting a farm in our hometown, we were so blessed and lucky to have so many cousins and neighbors and friends of friends lend us pieces of equipment and time and just like, our family showed up for us. And it's one thing that was super handy is a lot of my cousins in this picture are dairy farmers who aren't so busy in the winter. So it actually worked out perfectly that our greenhouse kit showed up in January versus September when they would have been cropping. And plot twist, so did Australia. So this is Nick and Steph, and they were our first ever employees by the fate of 
mother nature or God, I don't know who. So Nick and Steph actually had zero farming experience and they had had uh, travel visas to come to Canada. But because of COVID and the pandemic, they couldn't enter the country unless they got a job doing agriculture or some sort of uh, essential work. So they ended up like getting in touch with like this gal from my hometown who put them in touch with a cousin of mine and then the cousin of mine put them in touch with me and they ended up coming and essentially helping us build our farm they have no previous farming experience nick was actually a professional videographer which you'll see why later was fantastic and really benefited us and stephanie believe it or not was a full-time fashion stylist so just unbelievable they seriously are two incredible people that changed our lives and really left their mark on our farm and here's a video of them in their first ever canadian winter building a greenhouse in minus 20. oh but uh Yep, they showed up with their rubber boots, insulated coveralls, and balaclavas ready to roll. So again, Nick being a videographer, he made such beautiful videos of our farm and documented a lot of us getting going. So this is one of our first videos that we did for a contest to try and win some free gardening tools, but it's a cool video. And in it, you'll actually see us planting that big greenhouse that Nick and Steph were building for the very first time ever. I was extremely stressed out, but I played it cool. We're Rutabaga Ranch, and we're in our first season of wrangling rutabagas and growing great grub for our community. We're a one acre market garden, and we do all good things from minimal till to biodiversity and focusing on soil health. And we even got chickens. <laughs> Starting a market garden is really tough. But with a lot of help from our friends and some random ass Australians who showed up. Good night, mate. Right? Things are rocking and rolling. Most of the hand tools that we used actually came with the farm when we bought this herbivore heaven. But we make do in trade off for the beautiful infrastructure that we have built, like this nursery. And like this greenhouse we built in January. The home of the Rutabaga Ranch was a beat up Left 4 Dead farm that was built long before us in 1870. We love you, Growers & Call. Y'all are doing God's work by making market gardening mainstream. And thanks so much for coming on down and checking in on all the groovy things growing down here at the ranch. Bye! Woo. We're rooted back. So yeah, super handy, especially because us as vegetable farmers, we're direct to consumer people. So we actually have to engage and advertise and show off what we do. Um, so yeah, Nick, being a videographer was amazing. And in that last slide where me and Robbie are standing in front of the fire truck, that's actually where the farm stand is now. So our farm has changed a lot, even just since this video came about. We're rude of beggar. Oh. <laughs> All right. So this is a bird's eye view of our farm in 2019 when we bought it. You can kind of see that our nine acres is a pie shape. And this is 2020 when we started to dig our permanent raised beds. Um, yeah. And then this is 2021, whenever, like in our first year of production. So you can see a bird's eye view of a vegetable farm, no-till, small scale organic vegetable farm actually looks quite a bit different than another farm would from the sky. Mm -hmm. And since this was taken the year that we put in all our permanent irrigation lines, there's not much grass, uh, kind of dirt pass everywhere. But now that has since been filled in with wildflowers and clover and different beautiful species to kind of attract wildlife and biodiversity. Um, but as much as a new farm needs a greenhouse, we also needed a name. And one of the number one questions I always get asked is why we named our farm Rutabag Ranch. What does a rutabaga symbolize? Do you only grow rutabagas? What even is a rutabaga? The answer is 
We named our farm Rutabag Ranch because we thought it was funny. So this is a picture of my dearest childhood friend, Little Kim, and she is holding our first ever, back before the farm was even a farm, restaurant order. So this was a couple pounds of garlic that Iron Forge in Winchester bought from us. And I needed to write a farm name on the bill. And I had joked around with my family and friends like, oh yeah, I'm going to call the farm Rutabaga Ranch. And my mom would get so mad at me because she'd be like, oh, you got to take things seriously. You can't name your farm Rutabaga Ranch. Well, this is my mom and she works with us full time and is now referred to as Mama Bega. So you can name your farm whatever the hell you like. Uh, we want to make sure you at least learned one thing from this presentation. So a rutabaga is thought to be an ancient cross between a turnip and a cabbage, therefore as a hybrid vegetable. The more you know. So now we're farming, you know, a couple Australians, one greenhouse, that's it. We're farming now. And this is another video that Nick did that kind of shows the life cycle of a cucumber on our farm. And you can see that what we do is very hands-on and we actually don't have tractors on our farm it's bit we are what's called human scale and on a plus 35 degree day it feels pretty human scale kids have you ever met miss lindy she's a gal with a bright red hair now she stands high from all the rest you know her approach to farming. One reason why we are what's called human scale and why we do so much by hand is because we grow so many different crops. So if we were to mechanize and buy tractors and implements for every single 40 some crops we grow, we would have that's a lot of money up front, you know, we have to buy the cedar that can do all these things, then we have to buy the weeder to do all these things because we're organic. Then we have to buy the picker that picks cucumbers and tomatoes, which are two different things. Um, so yeah, it's a different kind of approach to farming, but it's what we like to do. And so yeah, that first year we celebrated our first harvests. Uh, this amount of tomatoes comes out of our greenhouse in peak season twice a week. 
So it's a hell of a lot of tomatoes. We kind of grow under the idea of grow better instead of bigger. So these tomato plants that are in this greenhouse, we let fertilize them with the most beautiful blend of organic fertilizers. And we prune them perfectly every single week. We dedicate a lot of time to get big harvests out of there. Um, if we were to calculate kind of the amount of members we have at the farm, farm stand, customers, as well as market sales, we're estimating that we're feeding about 200 families weekly off our one acre, which is pretty uh, big patates, if you know what I mean. Uh, we did our first farmer's markets. This is one of my favorite pictures ever. I was so scared to do our first farmer's market that I made everyone on the farm set up our display on the front lawn so we didn't show up to Ottawa looking like we didn't know what we were doing. And we had a down pack, man. Like the van was packed up. We got to the Byword Market. We had everything down to the tablecloth, except for it. We didn't have our debit and credit machines yet, and we're only going to accept cash, but we forgot any sort of change or a float. So my poor ma got a phone call at 6 a.m. frantically to get her out of bed and figure something out. And she actually stopped at Ben's gas station, the Pioneer in Winchester, and at six in the morning, and Ben hooked her up and sold her a bunch of change. So Ben, you saved the day wherever you are. Seriously, our first market was a raging success because of you. And then we've been to the market every single weekend since. And we plan to go to the market every single weekend for the rest of our lives. So now that we've touched on the who's and when's of Rutabaga Ranch, we should probably talk about the hows and whys. Regenerative agriculture is sexy and how your local farmers are saving the planets, baby. The word regenerative agriculture is essentially a white rebrand of the farming practices that our indigenous folks have been using for thousands of years before we white settlers stole their land. As we talk about farming with nature, it's important that we pay tribute to those who have done it all. And here's a little video of some farmers talking that I thought was interesting and you should watch. There are only two types of agriculture. There's regenerative agriculture and degenerative agriculture. And every other kind of agriculture is one or the other. What's regenerative is management and the decision-making process. My goal is not simply to sustain the current condition, but to regenerate it into what it once was. And what has been lost is how the land was conceived of. It's still held up in that way in other in Afro-Indigenous communities and Black and Indigenous communities and other communities, a different conception of land as an elder that can only be stewarded and cared for in communities. Is a lot of these practices and a lot of this knowledge has been held for hundreds of years by people Indigenous to this continent. There are cultures that have always upheld regenerative practices and always understood the holism and the utter dependency of this human race on every other species in every native environment. It's our way of life. It's, it's, it holds up to our practices, our, our stewardship practices, our faith and believing things, our ability to have respect and reverence for all things. Well, I'm looking at the people who are actually doing a regenerative part of the agriculture because I feel like indigenous people, especially, and people of color, they've been doing this their whole life. Our farming is directly tied to our ceremonies and our religious beliefs. And so therefore it's resilient as, as the get go because those two things need each other. Instead of us being, you know, top down managers of a natural system, we can humble ourselves. I mean, there's, there's no way that you can't work with nature. I farm in sync with nature. We raise cattle in sync with nature. Now we, we no longer fight seasons. So it's, it's restoring a natural balance, and it's it, the, the biggest thing that we've really learned is that it 
sequesters carbon in the soil. So it removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and it actually fixes it in the soil and it keeps it in the soil. When we get the soil right, everything corrects itself. True health begins with the soil. Yeah, and if you have healthy soil, you have healthy pastures. If you have healthy pastures, you have healthy livestock. If you have healthy livestock, what they are producing is a healthy um, food. We farm this way because we recognize the connection between our own health, our family. Okay. Oh. So yeah, regenerative agriculture is kind of like a whole bunch of different things. Um, and there's thousands of ways that you can use it in practice. So all that to say is regenerative agriculture is a holistic management of land that works in sync with nature and the systems that are already at play. There are thousands of ways we can farm with nature. Today, we're gonna to focus on a few that get my gears grooving. So that's no-till and biodiversity and how all that equals nutrient density. So let's talk about soil, baby. Soil, it's one of the most underrated and little understood wonders on our fragile planet. Here's why. Far from being lifeless dirt, it's estimated that in a single gram of soil, there could be as many as 50,000 species of microscopic organisms or microorganisms. And in one teaspoon of soil, there are more microorganisms than there are people on the earth. But much of what lies beneath in this hidden and deep universe is still alien to us. Despite being literally under our feet, humans have so far only identified a tiny fraction of the extraordinary life teeming underground. But these animals and microorganisms provide an invaluable role. Millions of years of evolutionary competition have led the microorganisms to produce antibiotic compounds to fight their neighbors. And these compounds form the basis of many of the antibiotics used by us humans. We literally make medicine from our soil. No one knows how many new treatments could be lying under our feet, waiting to be discovered. One of the most special creatures living in soil is the earthworm. Darwin was fascinated by them and said, It may be doubted if there are any other animals which have played such an important part in the history. Okay. Due to their importance, in making and sustaining soil. Earthworms journey down and around, creating breathing holes like lungs in the soil. This creates space for plant roots to grow and keep soil alive. Under the soil, there are also vast and intricate webs of fungal threads. Plants and fungi need each other to thrive, and so they do a deal. Fungi can't capture carbon dioxide to grow like plants can, but they're better than plants at mining the soil for nutrients, so they trade. Plants give fungi carbon to grow, and fungi give plants nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. It's a mutually beneficial relationship, and just one example of the interconnected ecosystem we're all part of. Plant matter decays and provides food for microbes. They provide food for worms, worms are food for birds, and so on. Soil provides us humans with almost everything we eat. But it's not just about what soils can do for us. It's important we value, appreciate, and crucially protect soil for a whole load of other reasons too. Think about this for a moment. It takes more than a hundred years to build just five millimeters, half a centimeter of soil, but just moments to destroy through chemical contamination, urbanization, landslides, erosion, and more. Some soil is really ancient, dating back millions and millions of years. The oldest soil on Earth is thought to be in South Africa and dates back 3 billion years. In the UK, our soil is around 15,000 years old and it formed after the last ice age. Soil is also a really valuable carbon store, capturing carbon, locking it away in stable forms deep underground. It stores three times as much carbon as all the plants on Earth combined, including trees. But because it grows so slowly, we need to protect what we have. We are not succeeding. We know many of the problems. Intensive farming is one of them. It releases carbon from our soils, and we're losing soil 50 to 100 times faster than it's able to rebuild. In Europe, 60 to 70% of soils are thought to be unhealthy. And in croplands in the UK, 
in less than 30 years from the end of the 1970s, we lost more than 10% of the carbon the soil had stored for us. And since then, well, we just don't know. Because in many countries, there's little data on soil, it's poorly protected and regulated. We grow on it, build in it, build from it. It filters and cleans our waters, reduces flooding and regulates our atmosphere. It's one of the most biodiverse habitats on Earth and a vital part of the nitrogen and carbon cycle on our planet. But the sad truth is, right now, soil hasn't enough champions fighting for it. We literally treat it like dirt. And yet there is so much untapped potential, so much wonder and so many secrets just waiting to be discovered in the ground beneath our feet. Pretty cool stuff, yeah. So um, a couple key points. Worms are great. Fungus is great. Having living things in soil is rad. And two, soil actually sequesters carbon. I think that's relatively new science. Pretty cool. Soil's at the heart of regenerative agriculture which means it's very important how we, your farmers, choose to work with it or not. So what's no-till? Um, this thing I'm holding in my hand is not a torture device. It is one of the number one ways we work soil on our farm. Um, to farm no-till or minimal is that you do not disturb or flip soil. So flipping the soil this way is can actually cause a lot of harm which i'm gonna tell you about so yeah um one of the number one ways number one things people think whenever they're like all right it's springtime let's get our garden going is they crack out the rotor tiller but the rotor tiller actually ends up causing what i like to call the blender effect so our homies, the earthworms, the microbacteria in the soil, as well as the fungus in there, they don't want to be blended. The worms don't want their house blended any more than you do. Um, as well, the rumbling and the vibrations of a rotor tiller or large scale farm equipment will actually cause the worms to kind of like burrow really deep. So their poop isn't benefiting the plants as well as we learned from that video the worms kind of like boogie through the soil and make tunnels which acts as the lungs of the soil because one thing that's not commonly known is plants need a layer of oxygen around their roots to be able to survive and thrive so yeah we don't want to blend our things yo dead soil means we need to use more synthetic fertilizer well we do not use synthetic fertilizer but other folks do that replicate the nutrients that occur naturally from our homies we just blended so the kind of interaction between these microbacteria the fungi the earthworms and all the living organisms in the soil create this beautiful perfect homeostasis for plants to live but if we blend all that up we then need more synthetic fertilizer um when we flip the soil, we break its structure. So again, this kind of flipping over motion will actually cause compaction, even though after you run a rotor tiller, you're like, oh my God, wow, so dreamy. You can plant things by hand. It's so loose. But what actually happens is you kind of just turn everything into dust. You kill all the earthworms that make these little boogie trails through it. What we would classify good soil is, is like porous layers of nutrients with plant plenty of openings and gaps for water and nutrients and roots to flow down. Compacted soil will have layers of tightly packed soil with few openings for water and nutrients to reach the roots. Compacted soil actually will also um, cause a lot of flooding and erosion. So um, even though it feels light, light and fluffy, it's not. And where we have not compacted soil, we have, oh yeah, sorry, these little skulls up here no good blender effect skull baby all right so then we get all our homies over here partying earthworms get a little party hat they want to live in loose non-compacted healthy soil but worst of all when we have compacted soil it's the number one cause of one thing we try to avoid at all costs on my farm 
ugly carrot syndrome. So carrots are kind of like a great uh, tattletaler on the health of the soil at your farm because they want to grow down deep. They want to grow down straight. And when you get ugly carrots like this, chances are it's because of the amount of rototilling or compaction you have in your garden. So here is a video of my cousin, Paul Westenbrook, who usually is driving big tractors. Here he is being the tractor using our broad fork. So you can see the broad fork kind of like penetrates down, cracks the soil open. But again, we're not getting the blender effect. Uh, you can cut a worm in half and it'll survive. So on our farm, we always use the broad fork first when we're planting. Cracks the soil open, which again allows air down in there, which we know plant roots are super happy with an air barrier. And the roots can boogie down, which means beautiful straight carrots. Check those guys out. And there's a little Keisha holding those bunches. The second thing we do to work the soil on our farm is for is called a power harrow for a walk behind tractor. So we have no ride on tractors, but we do use this walk behind tractor. This will look like a rotor tiller, but the difference between a power harrow and a rotor tiller is a rotor tiller does this. A power harrow does this. So again, flipping soil is what causes the physical property of it to break. Power harrow, like this, not so bad. And here's my mom. Look at her. Using the power harrow. So because we are human scale, we only plant by hand, which means we only actually need to power harrow the top two inches of soil, just enough to make a hole with our hands and put the baby plant in. So you can see the little baby plants, Stephanie in this picture is laying down on the ground. So literally just the depth of that root on the bottom is all we work, which leaves all the life and goodness and the worms completely undisturbed, not blended, super happy, partying with their party hats on in the soil underneath. No-till is fantastic and is one tool we can use to farm regeneratively. There are like, a hundred ways farmers of all scale can incorporate no-till into their practice, but we're not Puritans and we believe, believe tools have a time and a place. So again, we no-till is kind of like a fancy buzzword you say. We actually err on the side of minimal till and we will use a rotor tiller for planting our leeks because we plant them 10 inches deep and that's just the nature of farming. We do the very best we can with what we have. We actually tile drained our farm whenever we first got to our place because otherwise uh, come springtime, we'd be under like three feet of water. And tile drainage is where they put big drainage pipe deep into the soil so water moves away quickly. The most aggressive form of earth moving you could possibly do. But we did that once, you know? So all that to say is on an average day at Rooted Bike Ranch, we prioritize no-till practices and love having healthy soil, but you know, we do rotor till one time a year to plant our leeks, baby. So now let's talk about biodiversity, baby. Um, to talk about biodiversity, it's kind of easiest to talk about what biodiversity is not, which the opposite of biodiversity is monoculture. Um, I'm sure y'all have driven by big, beautiful cornfields or bean fields coming out of Winchester or in our area. This is what most farms look like. And actually my favorite walking trail is a monoculture pine planting plantation. So why do people use, or wait, what is monoculture? So it's the cultivation of a single crop in one given area. So for example, this pine, implantation it's all just pine trees so one species living there why do farmers use monoculture well it's easier you only have one planting date and one harvest date you only need to buy one harvester one picker and one weeder or sprayer um you can really scale up and grow a lot without relying on physical labor like we do um and Another thing I wanted to touch on is just because food is organic does not necessarily mean that it's grown in an environmental 
perfectly conscious fashion. There are a lot of um, organic farms that are monoculture as well. And where we have monoculture implantations, what can happen without a diverse crop rotation, which a lot of farmers do, um, is nutrient depletion and a bigger risk for pests, which means more pesticides. So even in organic operations, you can sometimes see thousands of acres of cabbage being planted. And because there's just this huge hotspot of cabbage, all the cabbage moths in the area flock to it, party in the cabbage, and then those farmers will douse the cabbage in organically approved pesticide. You dig? So, yeah. Um, monoculture also creates what's called a biodiversity desert. There's little to no trees, only one crop growing. So again, it's a hot spot for pests. And there's nowhere for birds and bugs to live or hide. So a little bird does not want to cross a big open field because a hawk might peck it out of the sky. You know what I mean? Um, a deer running through, I guess they have places to hide and coyotes live in cornfields, but Compared to this picture, which is a biodiversity paradise, which could be like an old growth forest. Um, this is kind of the style we're trying to bring to our farm. So lots of places and ecosystems for all little critters to hide and live and thrive. And lots of different plants growing. So when we have lots of different plants growing, different trees, different shrubs, different grasses, we then have healthier soil. Because all the little bacteria in the soil are bio, they love diversity. So the more diversified the roots are and the give and take, the happier the soil is. So biodiversity is the variety of life in the world or in one particular habitat or ecosystem. So this little video here is of our bee garden. Um, so yeah, you can see lots of different colored flowers. And then the middle picture is just kind of what our farm looks like with lots of different crops all planted together. So again, we ha will have one or a couple beds of cabbage tucked in and hidden within our whole crop plan of the farm so the cabbage moss can't find us as easy. Um, as re organic regenerative agriculture farmers, we're not just growing food, we are growing an ecosystem. So Robbie and I have actually spent thousands of dollars in non-crop seeds and native species like this echinacea bee garden to attract as many bugs and bees as we possibly can so that like nature always balances itself out. So the more balanced the ecosystem is at our farm, the less pest pressure we actually will have. Back a hundred years ago, more farms looked similar-ish to ours. They had features like ponds and orchards and honeybees and milk cows and pigs and gardens, native species, overgrown grass. It wasn't the golf course look, you know what I mean? Workhorses, chickens, and all these different diverse uh, systems all kind of work together. And yeah, our farm, like I said, looks a lot different from a bird's eye view from the fields around it. So a, a very obvious difference of what biodiversity looks like versus a monocropped farming system. But we're, we're not gonna hate on anybody. That being said, we got to have love for all farmers, big, small, organic monocroppers or hippies like us, because all farms, in my experience, are rooted in family. Whether they're working, like whether the farmers work in the land in honor of the past generations or in hopes for future generations. This job is too damn hard to be farming without the idea of Get leaving something better for your kids or living, leaving a lifestyle for your kids or your nieces and your nephews or in honor of your grandmother, whoever. Um, farmers are adapting all farmers and trying the best they can to work within an ever-changing, broken, capitalistic food system. There needs to be more financial aid and incentive for the already debt-ridden farm so they can make some changes that benefit the land and soil we all grow on. And this is happening. Farmers um, really don't benefit from having 
dead, unhealthy soil. But at the same time, as a certified organic farmer, I have to pay $1,000 annually to be able to even call my vegetables organic. And then this guy comes to my farm and he does an audit and he digs through all my paperwork and it's a lot more time and money than just not having that stamp saying I'm organic, you know what I mean? So there's really no financial incentive for farmers to make these changes. The government needs to come out with more grant systems or I don't know, but we'll get there someday. So in conclusion, regenerative agriculture is sexy. Biodiversity and regenerative agriculture practices equal healthy soil. And that healthier the soil, the more nutrients are available to the crop. Um, and the healthier the crop, the more nutrients are available to you. So yeah, healthy soil, healthy people, healthy planet, baby. And if you're not convinced on why you should support some of your local food growers, like us, this was our team uh, who worked with us this season. Amazing group of gals. Food travels really far. We don't want no California girls. Our little skull friend is back. So a lot of our food comes from California, which is 4,769 kilometers away. So to get to the Osgood Township Agricultural Museum, that's one day and 19 of solid drive time. So we could think, okay, two days, whatever. But in reality, these transport trucks are only allowed to drive a certain amount of hours a day. And two, when the truckers are in California and it's hot as hell, they are going to want air conditioned so they can have a comfortable night's sleep. Or whenever they're boogieing up from the States into Canada and it's minus 40, they're going to want to leave some sort of a motor run to heat their bunk because, of course. So in reality, a lot of these van trailers can actually be idling for four days straight. And that's a lot of fuel to bring you something that probably could be grown in Canada or we could eat more in season. It's not natural to our eating systems or our food system at all to be eating, I don't know, food out of season. And food actually tastes better when it's grown in season. So uh, our furthest customer is only 80 kilometers from the farm. We do two farmers markets in Ottawa every single week and we deliver to local restaurants, but majority of our customers actually are our neighbors right up the road who visit our self-serve farm stand. So yeah, our food doesn't travel very far off the farm, which makes it even more environmentally friendly because even a farm that's growing organically or using regenerative agriculture in California is still a lot of gas, man. There are also so many incredible vegetable growers in the Osgood Township area. I guarantee you that there's a small regenerative egg farm within 20 minutes from your place. Like even if you're too far to purchase from us, if you were just to give a quick Google or like vegetable farm near me, I'm sure there's a market garden nearby. As we've gotten into this, it's been fascinating to see how many little awesome thriving farms there are in even SDG that I was never aware of. It's kind of like the best kept secret. You don't know. You don't know till you know. And how can you support your local growers? Well, you already are by educating yourself. Um, a lot of farms accept volunteers. I know on my farm, we uh, send our volunteers home with a minimum of 10 weeks worth of groceries in exchange for their hard work. You can share and follow uh, social media. That helps gain exposure purchase locally when you can. I promise you it's going to be 10 times better tasting. And you can go to your local farmer's market, purchase direct, talk to your farmers and educate yourself. What you folks are doing here tonight is incredible. It's Friday and here you are listening to a farmer blab on about vegetables. Wow. Um, another thing that's really cool about small farms is almost every single farm, like small scale vegetable farm I know, offers farm membership programs. So these programs are 
what's called community supported agriculture. And it's actually CSA week this week, just saying perfect timing. So what a community supported agriculture model is, you the consumer or the eater pay in my, the farmer's off season. So you pay me now or in the winter sometime. And as a thank you for you paying me in my off season, I give you on our farm, with some of our programs, we give you up to 10% more vegetables for um, helping us out because we have a lot of input costs in the spring. So come April, we have to buy seed, we have to pay for employee, employee labor, maintenance, this kind of thing, heating costs, but our, far, our farmer's markets don't start till May. So again, we're kind of like, you guys help us bankroll and in return, we save you money and you get more delicious, beautifully grown food that's grown in an eco-friendly way. Um, yeah, CSA is a really awesome model and it's a way for you to also feel more connected to your food and to your food growers. We forgot to do one this year because we were so busy, but we have in past and hope to continue in future. Uh, do private farm tour a private farm tour night for our csa members to tour the gardens check out the greenhouse and see where their food has been growing all year long it's awesome for kids to know that food doesn't just come from the grocery store it actually carrots come from the ground that makes kids really excited um so if you want to keep up to date on all the groovy things growing at our place you can check out our website. It is beautifully done. My friend Mel did it and it's a stunner. Uh, we also have Facebook and we're kind of a hoot on Instagram. I don't think you'll find other farm content quite like ours. We have a lot of fun with it. And I'd like to thank the Osgood Township Agricultural Museum for having us. If you guys have not been to this museum, you actually should come. It is the coolest. I'm here right now um it's not dusty and it's thriving like their gardens are beautiful the exhibit's gorgeous they have all kinds of fun things for family it's actually a vibrant little place and you should come check it out and thanks so much for having me thank you so much jamie thank you for your wonderful talk and all the work that you put into um teaching us about uh regenerative egg and your farm um, so I just want to take a minute um, to let anyone who has any questions um, feel free to ask away. You can type them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Um, if you type them in the chat, I can read them to Jamie. And yeah, so if anyone has any questions, feel free. I have a question in the meantime. There's nothing yet in the chat. Um, I was wondering, so what is the process um, like when you become uh, certified organic? What's that like? Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, it's hell on earth. <laughs> um, it really made me cry and still makes me cry a lot. Not because like following the organic standards, totally cool, fine, wonderful. But the documentation and the paperwork that they want, and I myself, I'm not very good at computer type of things. It took me probably 14 years to even make this slideshow on PowerPoint. Um, so yeah, the process is really extensive. When they come look through all your paperwork, you have to have exact cropping dates and ex like everything is so not built for a farm like ours. We actually plant carrots 22 times in a season. So every single week we're planting carrots. So we have a continuous supply every single week for our farmers markets where in their documentation it's more for the big monocropper type organics who plant corn once a year um we didn't have to wait that long for our certification because the last owner signed off on the fact that and it's very obvious that our fields were just hayland forever um but i think it can take up to three five ten years i'm not actually sure to become certified organic if you uh are taking land that was in conventional corner soy and putting it into organic production 
So yeah, it's just kind of expensive wow. and a lot of paperwork, but it's important to me. That's crazy. Um, we do have a couple questions coming along here in the chat. Um, do you have, or do you compost and, or do any mulching? Um, so under the school of thought that we are farming under, um, the dude whose methodology we have taken and kind of made our own is that what we're doing is so full time that we don't actually as commercial vegetable farmers have time to be making compost in the perfect condition. So what can happen with a lot of compost piles is people will have them and they won't cover them or they won't stir them on time. It's not to say that composting isn't good. It's fantastic. And especially for a home gardener, awesome. Um, but what can happen is when it rains, a lot of the nutrients will be leached out of the compost and just go right into the ground, which is healthy and fine. But then I don't know what nutrients are in that compost when I'm putting it on my fields. And we used a pretty targeted approach. We get our soil sampled every single year. Um, and we have an agronomist who is a fancy dirt doctor who makes us fertilizer plants based off that. So we buy in organic mushroom compost from the mushroom farm. Carlton, I think it yes. is. Yeah. Yep. So we buy organic compost in. Um, and mulching, one thing that can happen, even though it's so beautiful and trendy on Pinterest, you see these gardens full of wood chips everywhere. Wood chip mulching can actually tie up new nitrogen in your soil and make your garden not grow that nice for the first couple of years. So we don't do any mulching. But one thing we do use is um, a synthetic, kind of like a plastic woven cloth that we will put on the vegetable beds that have holes in them. We'll plant our plant, our long crops into the holes and then we rip it up and we actually reuse these fabrics over and over again. They should be good for the entirety of my farming career. So that helps a lot with weed pressure. But I heard people have great success mulching with hay. Interesting. Hmm. Alrighty, um, we do have another question here. Um, I gotta open this chat bigger so I can see more. <laughs> um, the webinar recording will be available, yes, on our um, on our YouTube page, and we will post the link probably to social media so that everyone knows um, when they can access it later. Um, we have another question here. Uh, thank you for the talk. We are not fortunate with the quality of our soil very clay and compacted. Is there any way to fix it? Thanks. Um, my number one recommendation would be to work with an agronomist because they are specialists in soil health and they can make extremely targeted and extremely specific recommendations of your specific soil. Like soil varies so much, like even concession to concession, my the soil on my family farm is totally different from the soil where I am. But on heavy clay, some of my girlfriends who have vegetable farms, what they have done is just lay a lot of compost, baby. Keep investing. So the more in organic matter, which means all those living things in the soil, so worms, microbacteria, all these living creatures in the soil, the more loose decompacted your soil will kind of get over time is my general understanding so lots of compost don't don't give up the good fight clay can be <laughs> unforgiving and tricky <laughs> um, another uh comment here thank you ever so much very well done a lot of hard work um someone saying here in all caps how are the chickens <laughs> how are the chickens oh my god okay so the chickens are great they are alive well and thriving they are very pissed off at me because I bought a very expensive investment in this fancy nesting box because I realized we spend around like an hour a day feeding our chickens, cleaning their eggs, whatever. So I bought this fancy nesting box that was very expensive and supposed to save my life and make my days easier. 
where the chickens lay and then the eggs kind of roll to the front. So the chickens can't peck the eggs and there's also no caca on the eggs because we don't want the city people to know that eggs come from chickens, but so <laughs> then we spend a lot of time cleaning eggs, not actually cleaning them because it's bad to clean eggs, but spot cleaning eggs, you dig? So anyways, I thought this was gonna save our, our save us lots of time and lots of troubles, but they don't like it. So they're not laying in it. And I've been having to try and convince them with lots of really expensive, fancy grub worms that I put in this thing. So they go and they eat their treats in there and they feel more comfortable. So I'm hoping they lay, but we're having no critter problems right now. We have about 70 in the flock. Excellent. They're really cute. We have four ducks right now and I don't think we will ever not have ducks on the farm. They are so funny. And if you don't have ducks, you need to get some ducks. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, lots of nice comments. Love the chat. Thanks for talking, taking the time to talk with us. Thank you. Um, yeah, learned so much. Thank you. Amazing story and information. Inspiring. Thank you. Wow. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> one thing I would like to say is that we do offer farm tours in the summer. Uh, last season, we did them every Saturday, but I'm hoping to pick up a Saturday market instead of doing uh, that. So, but we have one scheduled for, I think in June or September. But if you keep, would like to come, you can check out our social media and we will post when you can come to our farm and meet us and eat some carrots and check our stuff out. Amazing. Okay, so, oh, one more comment here. Good job, Jamie, from Burrell Farm. <laughs> oh, thanks, Dane. Love you so much. If you want the best jerk chicken ever, you got to check out Dane's farm, Burrell Farms, at the Ottawa Farmer's Market. Lands down every single Sunday. I eat his jerk sauce on everything. It is fantastic, and he grows all the things in it. Dane, I love you. Hope you're having a good winter, man. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jamie. Thanks for all your hard work. Um, it's been a pleasure getting to know you over the past couple of weeks. Thanks for everything. I hope everyone has a great night. Okay, bye. Bye, everyone. Good night, everybody.